He doesn't need to stand. He can come up and join the artist. Oh, bloody stop. Bloody stop. Bloody stop. Everybody, and good morning to all those who are joining us for this very first uh, Dovecot live stream. Exceptional days mean we have exceptional, we need exceptional measures to be able to communicate the Word of God and to worship God, and that's what we want to do uh, today. So, a welcome to everybody, and uh, we're broadcasting from Dovecot Church, and this will be our pattern for the next few weeks given the problems in the nation, in the continent of Europe and indeed in the world with this terrible scourge of corona uh, virus. We invite you to join us and we invite you to let others know, to tune in and to the practical side of that, it's all available on the website of Dovecot Evangelical Church, how to do this. So if you want to direct people to our website, then that would be uh, Great. What we're going to do today, um, in a few uh, minutes, I'm going to pray. We're going to pray for our world and worship the Lord and pray for the situation in which we find ourselves, pray for ourselves as we gather around the Word of God through uh, the tech enabled by this technology. We're going to sing. We're going to sing a great gospel hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet 
the sound. We're going to open God's Word, and can I invite you to uh, where you are to get hold of God's Word, a copy of the Bible. We're going to be reading from Romans chapter 4, continuing where we left off our message last week, the life of Abraham. And then we're going to consider God's Word to us today. And then finally, we'll sing a hymn before we break. So that's our plan for this morning. It's important to pray. And so I'd invite you now where you are to join with me as we pray to our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we first of all thank you that we can call you our Father. That's what the Lord Jesus said we should do. He who is your Son from all eternity invites those who believe to call you our Heavenly Father. We thank you for this great privilege. We come firstly, Lord, today to worship to remember that you are our creator. Lord, you are great in every way, great in being, great in, in power, great in wisdom, great in glory. And oh Lord, we thank you today that you are great in grace. And we will sing of that in just a few minutes time. We worship you, Lord, on this day that you have said is a holy day. The day when the Lord Jesus rose again from the grave, we come and worship we gather in our different homes and those who gather here. Lord, we want to pray for our world stricken with a terrible plague. We pray, Lord, for those in government making difficult decisions. We ask that you might help them and we pray for them that they might look to you, realise that this is in fact beyond them and that they need the intervention of God himself. We pray for those in power that they would not be uh, unbelieving, but they'd be willing to admit their own uh, weakness and they'd be willing, Lord, to turn to you. We pray for those on the front line of our health services uh, who will bring care and, and help to those in need. And particularly we pray, Lord, for those in Italy in the front line there with that terrible situation that they find themselves in. Would you help them, Lord, we ask, and help and bless in every way. We pray for ourselves, Lord, sat at home or in this church, Lord. We are asking for your blessing upon us as we gather around your word, praying that you'd help us to focus and to concentrate and to listen to what you would have us learn as we open the word of God. Thank you, it is your word. It is the way which you speak to men and women today. Lord, we pray, may we hear your voice by the Holy Spirit speaking to us as we gather this morning. So we commit our time into your hands for your blessing upon everyone who's watching or who's listening. Lord, may you speak to each one. We make our prayer. We ask these things in the great name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So we're going to sing our hymn this morning. Our first hymn is number 487. For those who have a hymn book, it's Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans, back to the epistle of Paul, the great apostle, to the church that was in Rome. We're going to read from chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse uh, 13. 13. So this is following our journey as a church <coughs> through the book of Romans in a series, What the Gospel Really is what the gospel really is, and we're thinking today about God's promise to Abraham. Verse 13 For the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, Faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offences and was raised because of our justification. Let's pray before we consider God's message to us today. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you that you've not left yourself without witness in this world. Lord, you speak through creation. There is a God. You speak through our conscience. We know what it is to sin. But we thank you, Lord, that clearly and powerfully you speak to us through your word, to which we turn now and pray that you would indeed speak to us. In the name of Jesus, your son, we ask. Amen. Amen. These are momentous days, and of course, we're living in a worldwide epidemic of coronavirus. You don't need me to remind you of that. We do need to remember, God is still on the throne. These things don't take him by surprise, even though we're surprised at the way in which events are turning out. Secondly, as deadly as coronavirus may be, we do need to remember that there is another virus which affects every man, woman, and child on this planet. It's far older. And it's far more deadly. It's a spiritual virus called sin. And that is why we're looking at this book of Romans. There is an answer to the problem of sin. And it's found in the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Coronavirus may have affected hundreds of thousands. But sin affects millions and millions. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of of God. There is no known vaccine for coronavirus. People are working hard and we pray for them. But there is 
a remedy for sin. That is the gospel, friends. There is a remedy for sin. Produced at great cost, we read of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, which was shed for the remission of sins. No human vaccine is 100% effective. And no human vaccine is 100% safe. But the great news of the gospel is to all who believe, he is a perfect saviour, able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. What does that mean? To completely save. And dear friends, he won't do you any harm. Jesus only does good. Our faith is to be directed to him. And he said these words, he who comes to me, I will not turn away. He's open. His arms are open and he's willing to welcome you to be his child. So our questions today, how do we access the cure for sin? How does a man or a woman, a boy or a girl become saved from sin? How do I, who am a sinner and I know it, how do I become right with God? These are the great issues that are treated in the book of Romans and that are in our passage today. But before we go into our message, to just remind ourselves who is Abraham? Why are we talking about him? He lived 2,000 years ago, sorry, 2,000 years before the Lord Jesus Christ, about 4,000 years from now. In the city of Ur in southern Iraq. At God's command, he left home and took a 600 mile journey to the city of Haran, which is now in Turkey, and later on, another 700 mile journey to Canaan. Physically, he is so important because he's the ancestor of the Jews. All Jews take their descendancy from him, but not only the Jews. The Arab nations, many Arab nations, he is their progenitor, he is their ancestor. And of course, everyone who's a Christian, to the Christian, to the Christian believer, he is the father of us all by faith. So he's a great man. And he's the first man in the Bible to whom it is said he's justified by faith. What does that mean? He's accounted righteous by his faith faith not through good deeds he was a sinner as we all are but through faith he received a righteousness that was not inherent to himself we call that an accounted or accredited righteousness now at the present time you may not have much money in the bank i don't know where you stand on that one but if an infinitely rich person was to come and put their money in your account, your credit would go right through the roof and that money would be credited to you. And the great news of the gospel is this, that when we believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness, his right standing, his money is credited to our account. Not, of course, physical money, but his great righteousness becomes ours through faith. And Abraham was the first man in the Bible of whom that was said. Now we looked at three questions last week. How was Abraham right with God? And the answer, by faith. What happened to Abraham's sin? It was imputed to another. And the great news of the gospel is when I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he takes all my sin to himself Upon the cross, my sins are counted to him, and he gives freely all his righteousness to me. His righteousness is accounted to me. And we remember, don't we, as Christians, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? He's none other than God in human form. It is the righteousness of the God-man that is accounted to every believer in him. Well, the previous passage mentioned boasting before God. What is boasting? Boasting is when we pretend to have anything of our own to which a reward is due by God. And the Bible is clear. We have 
Abraham did not have anything to boast about, and neither do we. Boasted is excluded by the gospel. The gospel excludes boasting. It speaks of a righteousness not inherent, but given freely. So, three questions today. The first one, what about the law? That's what he deals with in verses 13 to 16. What is faithings, saving faith like? And he deals with that in verses 17 down to 22. And then the third question, what about us? So that's our journey today. What about the law? What's faith like? And what about us? So the question the apostle deals with in verse 13 is the law. Did God save Abraham through the law? And the answer is really easy. No. Because the law, that is the Ten Commandments, and all the Jewish law in the Old Testament, were not given until 430 years after the occasion of Abraham's receiving righteousness by faith. So it couldn't be by the law, could it? The law is good, but it does not save you. It tells you what to do, but conveys no ability. The law says... Don't drive above the speed limit, but if you do, the law does not save you. It simply ensures that you get the fine through the post. And of course, where there is no law, there is no transgression. You can't cross a line if the line isn't there. Abraham wasn't made righteous by keeping the law. That's what verse 17, verse 13 says. For the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, law keeping, Ten Commandments, but through the righteousness of faith. God didn't give Abraham a law. What did he give him? He gave him a promise. What did God's promises include? God promised Abraham he would give him a descendant through whom all the nations on earth would be blessed in you shall all the nations on earth be blessed that's what God said to Abraham through your seed through your descendant he promised Abraham 75 years old and his wife 65 years old that they would have descendants as the stars in the heavens for a multitude and he promised him a country a land it said here the heir of the world in fact it was far more than a physical land that God promised Abraham some years later Abraham was still childless and his wife well past childbearing age he prayed to God and God repeated his promise of many descendants and one in particular who would be the seed promised from the Garden of Eden the Lord Jesus Christ, in fact, is the fulfilment of that promise to Abraham. His wife Sarah was old. Humanly speaking, it was impossible. But he believed God's promise. And through that faith, he was justified. Three words, three Bible words to draw our attention to today. Promise, epangelia, an announcement by God, guaranteed by his own being and you can't get a bigger or better guarantee than that heir what's an heir an heir is one who receives an inheritance through sonship isn't that wonderful that those who are joined to god by faith become heirs of god adopted into his family and the third word here grace grace and that, of course, is verse 16. Salvation is of faith, that it might be according to grace. And grace, of course, selects its recipients. And the giver gets the glory. Think this through with me. In a reward situation, I work for my wages and I get what I deserve. I get the glory. I do the work, 
I get the credit. That's not the gospel. My works will never be good enough. They're not good enough. My works condemn me. They don't justify me. So I need grace. And in grace, another does the work. Another gives freely. And I get the blessing. He gets the glory. And that's the grace of God. It's the giver, not the worker, who gains the credit, the glory. One more word to think about here in this passage, and it's in verse 16. That the promise might be sure. Or by no. That means to walk where it is solid. I don't know if you've ever been on the beach when the tide has gone out and you walk out to, uh, to the sea and you, your feet sink into the soft sand and leave an impression it's not solid. Because sometimes it can be uh, dangerous to do that in certain beaches. But here the word is the opposite. To walk where it is solid. And of course those who believe God's promises are walking where it is solid because he's guaranteed them to be true. We're on solid ground when we believe the promises of God. Do you believe those promises today? Say, where are they found? They're found in the Bible. We read the Bible. We accept its teachings. We take them to ourselves. We trust and rely upon them. We're walking on solid ground. Are you doing that today? So that's was it was Abraham uh, saved through the law what about the law no he was not saved through keeping the law which uh, only came into being 430 years later so what was Abraham's faith really like well these verses we get a description of Abraham's faith in verses 17 to 22 but just before we go there it was written I've made you a father of many nations. I did a quick look on the internet and 4,000 years after God said this, there are over 20 million Jews in the world, taken from Wikipedia's article, that was a census done in 2018, 2018, 20.7 million Jewish people all descended from Abraham. There are over 400 million Arab nations who are descended from Abraham. See how God's word is true? I will make you father of many nations. But there are over 600 million evangelical Christians who are children of Abraham by faith. You see, the message of Romans is this. We do not have to be circumcised to be children of Abraham or justified. Abraham was uncircumcised when he believed. We do not have to receive or have received or obey the law to be justified. We can't do it. But we can be joined to Abraham, joined to Christ in the way that Abraham was through faith. We become his children and co-heirs with him of the same wonderful promises, heirs of the world to come. So what was Abraham's faith like? Three words. Verse 17, we read that Abraham's faith was before God. Before God, in the presence of him who believed. Before God. And this is a great truth, friends. It was a personal faith. Abraham knew God personally. Isn't that wonderful? That the great God who made all things can be known by us. Personally, Jesus said we should call him our Father. And the God of the Bible is a personal yet infinite trinity of persons who we come to know intimately when we trust him as our Saviour. Abraham's God and dealings, or Abraham's dealings with a personal God, a God who deals with individuals. Can I ask you, have you had personal dealings with the living God? God and you can do you can have how through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ in fact Jesus said these words Abraham has seen my day to the Jews of Jerusalem Jesus said before Abraham was I am 
and it was Jesus who he manifested himself uh, to Abraham those years ago as Abraham journeyed the roads of uh, Canaan. God is a personal God. Abraham's faith was a personal faith. Abraham's faith was in spite of circumstances. Verse 19, not being weak in faith, he didn't consider his own body already dead since he was 100 years old, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham was promised vast descendants, vast numbers of children of descendants, and yet he was uh, well, he was 99 at this point, and his wife was 90 before she gave birth to Isaac. And yet he believed in God in spite of the circumstances. Sometimes we have to believe in God in spite of the circumstances. Verse 19 is, it speaks of the deadness of Sarah's womb. That's important because he's going to speak in a few minutes of the resurrection. The God who raises from the dead. And Abraham's body was as good as dead and his wife's womb was dead. He didn't look at the problems. He looked at the Lord who solves the problems. And his faith was in the God who raises the dead. It was in spite of circumstances. He believed in God who gives life to the dead. Verse 17, and calls those things which do not exist into being. That's a better translation there. This is a reference to creation. We worship the God who started with nothing and created everything through his word. That is the God of the Bible. Ex nihilo creation, creation from nothing. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God that Abraham worshipped. He didn't look at the problems, Sarah Barron, he looked at the Lord, and God answered and vindicated himself. Abraham's faith was personal, it was in spite of circumstances, and verse 21, fully convinced, fully persuaded, complete. Abraham's faith was complete. 